Hello students. This week we're going to talk about due process of law. We're going to start off and spend a short amount of time once again discussing civil law. We will then go ahead and move into criminal law. Quick reminder, civil law, it deals with private rights and relationships, obligations or responsibilities. The cases are brought by plaintiffs usually private citizens or corporations. However, please remember that the plaintiff or the defendant, that either party can be the government. Civil law is not reserved strictly for private citizens or corporations. The relief from a civil, a civil lawsuit, remedy from a civil lawsuit, is relief or compensation Compensation is money. You are paid for your injuries. You are paid for your harm. Relief, the accuser, the, the defendant, excuse me, the accused, the defendant is ordered to stop their harm. They are ordered to stop doing whatever it is that is hurting you. If we look at the origination of civil law, we understand that civil law is based on common law. This is simply judge-made law based on precedence. Precedent is simply the judge is referring to laws that were or judicial decisions that were settled beforehand. You are looking back to see how an item was handled, how an item was decided. You are going to use this item to help you in your decision now. You do not want to change precedent. You are going to look for things that will help you. This way we have a consistent and a fair judicial system. Everybody knows what to expect. Other than common law, we have something called statutory law. Statutory law is a law that has been passed by legislative bodies and is written in code books. It is codified. It is written down somewhere. Our first example of statutory law is called the Code of Hammurabi. It was a Babylon, uh, from Babylon. It was a law code from Babylon, or actually of Mesopotamia. It dates back to 1754 BC. And this is our first example of codified law. This is our first example of law that was written down. Why do we need law to be written down? Why do we need to be able to see it, to be able to read it? Why, why is this so important? Well, the answer is simple. What if the officers of the police come in one day and said, you're under arrest for this reason. You have broken this law. Well, can you show me this law that I broke? No. You're, you've just broken the law that I said you broke. So how do we know that there's a law? How do we know that we are being treated fairly unless there's some sort of code or there's some sort of codified law, some sort of written law we can refer to that can tell us if we're actually breaking the law or not. That is the importance of, of having this codified law. <clears throat> In Texas law, we see many things that civil law can be applied to. Some of these things that civil law covers is common law marriage. What exactly is common law marriage? We have I provided a link that explains to you when common law marriage went into effect. Homestead laws. What happens to our homestead? What do we need? What's the official position or what officially needs to happen for us to, to declare our homestead exemption? Probate. Probate is dealing with wills and estates. Civil law deals with that. Corporations, how do you incorporate? What rights and protections do they have under the law? 
right to work laws. When, can, when do they have to pay you overtime? When are you exempt? These types of things. Negligence, slander, libel. These can be called. These can be considered. Some of these can be considered criminal offenses, but these are going to be civil offenses. Negligence. You did something, but you should have known that you could have harmed somebody. Slander or libel. You are you are saying something that is. You don't have to worry about it being untrue or not, but you're making an untrue statement with the intent of hurt of hurting somebody's character. We do have issues in civil law in Texas. Tort reform. Tort reform is laws passed by the legislature that they were an attempt to somewhat limit access to the court system. There was a reason. One reason was we were trying to to restrict lawsuits by prison inmates. And I don't mean the, the legitimate lawsuits. I mean the waste of time lawsuits because the criminal inmates have nothing better to do. You know, some of our best, uh, our best minds, our best law minds are actually in jail. They have spent so much time in prison and they have access to law books and they study them day in and day out. An example of a, a lawsuit that we're trying to prevent. One point, Texas got sued in civil court because an inmate stated that we are violating his Eighth Amendment right against cruel and unusual punishment. How do we violate this right? He claimed we violated this right because we served him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for like four consecutive days for lunch. These are the type of lawsuits we're trying to, to restrict. We're trying to reduce frivolous lawsuits. We have seen people sue for the strangest, the oddest reasons. They, they have no leg to stand on. They're suing it to harass people. I remember at one point, and this is fairly recently, I saw a lawsuit, a gentleman sued his new neighbors because he could look inside their home, listen to me, he could look inside their home, he had to make the effort to look and see them walking around naked. So he sued his neighbors for this. Never mind the fact that he didn't need to be looking in their home, never mind the fact he had to make this effort to, do, to become a peeping Tom. But that would be a frivolous lawsuit. Limiting liability in civil cases involving multiple defendants and capping jury awards of punitive damages. We, are, we see these lawsuits that people have deep pockets. Let's go with the first. Let's go with limiting liability in civil cases involving multiple defendants. If you ever noticed, if you go to a mall and there's an injury, you're going to sue, who are you going to sue? Are you going to sue the little store that you were in when you were injured? No, you sue the little store, you sue every store in the mall, and you sue the mall. Why do you do this? Because you're looking for the company that has, quote, deep pockets. You're looking for the company that says, you know what, I will pay you to go away. Here's $100,000. Here's $50,000. Drop me out of the suit. Leave me alone. Just, just go away. Capping jury awards of punitive damages. Punitive damages are a punishment in civil, in civil law. You get this compensation if you win your lawsuit. Well, also, punitive damages are meant to punish the company that, that broke the law, that did whatever. <clears throat> the reasoning behind this, this 
capping jury awards of punitive damages actually made sense to, to the state. Back in the early 2000s, Texans looked around and we had a number of doctors retiring or leaving the state and we didn't have any new doctors coming in. As a doctor, what is your most expensive cost of operating a practice? It's not your, it's not your staff, it's not your, your equipment, it's not your room. Your most expensive stuff is usually your malpractice insurance. So the idea behind this capping jury awards of punitive damages was that if we say, and I'm just, I'm pulling numbers out of the air. I don't know what the cap is today. But for example, if a doctor is looking at opening a practice in Texas or he's looking at opening a practice in New York. Remember, insurance is the most, the most cost, costly thing, the most cost prohibitive thing to prevent you from opening. So if you're in Texas, you know that you have a jury, a jury cannot award more than $2 million. Your insurance company knows this. In, in New York or California, whichever other state I said, there's no cap. They can award 20, 30, 40 million dollars. The insurance company does not know how much they will have to pay. They do not know a max. If they know your max is two million dollars versus your max might be 40 million dollars, how much is your premium going to be? Think about your auto insurance. The more coverage you have, the more, co the more money you have to pay. So if we cap that jury, uh, possible jury award at $2 million, and the insurance company knows this, this is going to cover the medical malpractice cost, the, medical, the cost of medical malpractice insurance, versus a state that does not have a cap. So the purpose behind that was to actually try to get more doctors to move into and open a business in Texas. I've included a list of if things worked in art, excuse me, an article. Ten years of tort reform in Texas, a review. It, it just looks at what has happened, has, has the plan worked as intended. We're going to go ahead and move into criminal law now. With criminal law, please remember, we are concerned with public morality. The concepts of right and wrong as defined by the government. It is the government, it is the state legislature that creates, our tech, that creates the Texas Penal Code, that creates the laws that say you can do this or you cannot do this. Our cases are prosecuted by public officials in criminal law at the trial level. The government is the plaintiff in all criminal cases at the trial level. The government is the only one who can accuse somebody of breaking the law. You can be a witness, you can say they hurt me, but they broke the law that was created by the state. The aim of criminal law is to punish. That is, that is simply it. In criminal law we see two types of crime. The first is going to be federal. So the, the federal government has their own court system and they also have their own laws. They have civil law, they have criminal law. Only 5% of crimes of criminal, criminal law, only criminal crimes, are prosecuted under federal law. Most of these are state crimes. Please recall the states get to do the heavy lifting. They, they have the power of coercion. They get to dictate, they get to decide what's going to be a state crime and what is not. Now, so that doesn't mean that there are not federal crimes. There are. Some of the federal crimes are if you commit a crime on the high sea, don't become a pirate. Simply what I'm trying to tell you. Commit a crime on federal property, post office, federal building, military base. These are all federal, federally owned properties, federal park. Commit a crime there, you've just committed a federal crime. 
involving the crossing of state or national boundaries. And usually what I tell my gentlemen here, you know, you may think it's funny to throw your girlfriend in the back of your vehicle and drive to Louisiana or something for breakfast or for dinner. You better hope she has a sense of humor because if she doesn't, you just kidnapped her. And because you crossed a state line, it is now a federal crime. Guys, don't do this. Ask her if she wants to go. Interfering with interstate commerce. You hijack a truck that's coming from Bentonville, Arkansas, coming from Walmart in Arkansas to here. That is interstate commerce because it is dealing with money flowing from one state to another. That is a federal crime. Are any crime committed against the national government? These are all the federal crimes. These are all types of federal crime. Federal crime is one type. The second type is state crime. <coughs> now in Texas, we can classify our, our state crimes, our, our criminal, excuse me. We can classify our criminal crimes into two types. The first is felonies. And we can even classify felonies as degrees. The felonies are the serious crimes such as murder or robbery. So felonies are the most serious crimes, but we have degrees of felony. We break these serious crimes into less serious versus more serious. Our lowest level of the less are the less serious crimes. I hate using these terms, but this is basically what it is is misdemeanors. And we can, once again, classify these also. We use letters to classify our misdemeanors. These are going to be lower level crimes such as traffic violations, driving under the influence, could be assault, it could be theft, this kind of thing. There's a discussion. Do all crimes have victims? There's an argument that we do have some victimless crimes. Prostitution or gambling could be examples of these. You know, gambling, if you choose to go participate, you willingly go and lose your money. Is that a victimless crime? Because you willingly put yourself in that situation. Prostitution, if you willingly, and the, the key term here is willingly, go and sell your body, and remember, this can be men or women, I'm not limiting this. This can be either gender. If you willingly go sell your body in exchange for money, for food, whatever, is this a victimless crime? Because you are willing to engage in this con conduct. I'm not talking about the, the sex rings, the people forced into it. I am talking about the people who willingly engage in this conduct. I've included a table here that talks about or that shows you the classifications of our crimes, some of the offenses, what they can be, the terms, the sentence ter possible sentence terms, and we attach fines to our criminal, our criminal penalties. So if you're talking, look at our top one, capital murder. This is the most serious felony. It includes murder of police officer, firefighter, prison guard, or child younger than the age of six, murder for hire, murder committed with certain other felonies, mass murder. Your terms. You have two options. Life without parole or death. That's, that's it. Those are the only two options if you are convicted of capital murder. Maximum fine. There's no maximum fine. You're not getting out. You're not going to have any money. First degree felony. These can include aggravated sexual assault, theft of money or property greater than $200,000, robbery, murder, sale of more than four grams of hard drugs, first degree felony. Remember our felonies, these are degrees, and we label them according to serious. So we have capital at the top, first degree, second degree, third degree, then state jail felony. First degree murder, your sentence is gonna be five to 99 years, or a fine of 
second degree felony, two to 20 years, a fine of $10,000. Third degree felony, two to 10 years, a fine of, of $10,000. State jail felony, your sentence can be 180 days to, to two years. You're looking at a possible $10,000 fine. Now, really besides the seriousness of the crime, <coughs> we're discussing incarceration. These felonies, if you're convicted of a felony, you will be incarcerated in the state penitentiary, the state pen. These are located at various areas throughout Texas. You can be sent to any one of these state penitentiaries. For your misdemeanors, or your, your state jail felony are your misdemeanors, your class A misdemeanor, your class B misdemeanor. If you were in, if you were found guilty and you were given time to serve, you will serve your time in the local jail. You see a class A misdemeanor, remember we do these by letters, up to one year in jail, up to a $4,000 fine. Class B misdemeanor, up to six months in jail, up to 180 days, maximum fine of $2,000. The Class C misdemeanor is the only crime that has no jail term attached to it, no jail time. The Class C misdemeanor, the maximum fine is $500. This is just for fun. <clears throat> I'm going to show you some of the stranger laws that are out there because everybody passes strange laws. Tennessee makes it illegal for anyone other than a zoo to import skunks. West Virginia makes it illegal to taunt someone that's fighting a duel. Texas makes it a crime to disturb someone who is hunting. Rhode Island requires that a driver must make a loud noise when passing on the left. North Carolina limits their bingo games to five hours. New Jersey and Texas make it illegal to wear a bulletproof vest while committing murder. In Wisconsin, it is a crime for restaurants to serve margarine unless requested by the customer. These are just there for fun. These are real laws, too. I want you all to understand that. But let's start talking about crime and the overall process. Let's, let's look at everything involved in crime in Texas. The first person we're going to discuss is the criminal. In Texas, we see a number of similarities in those who commit crimes. They're young. What's not listed, and it's true, is usually they're male. The good news is, by young, I mean 25. Usually by the age of 25, most males have started to, or have grown out of their criminal tendency. So gender is male, young, we're talking about 25 years or younger. They're poor, hence the need to commit crime. They're going to be a racial or ethnic minority. They may have acute emotional problems. They have little value for the law. Come on, we could have figured this out, I know. We have seen a rise in gangs over the last 20 years or so. And part of the, the feeling here, part of the idea, is that gang membership provides a family. It provides a surrogate family that the criminal doesn't have at home because either they're, they're coming from a broken home, there's no money, they're providing the love, the support that they're not receiving from the mother, the father, who, whoever. I've also provided a link to the FBI crime statistics. They publish this on a yearly basis. So we have a criminal, but we must have a victim. What we see has, is that crime has declined since 1991. That's supposed to be declined, not declines. Crime has declined since 1991. At least certain types, overall crime has declined. Certain types have, have increased, but overall crime has declined. 
uh, provided a, a link to the historical crime rates. The highest rate of victimization occurs in poor urban neighborhoods. What we find in here is that when they, the victim, or excuse me, the criminal stays and preys in their own neighborhood, preys, P-R-E-Y-S, not P-R-A-Y-S, we see that these crimes are often against friends or family of the criminal. They know them. They're easy to get to. They, they might know how to get in. They know what items are there. If you're the victim of a crime, you have the right to be informed of investigation and court proceedings. We see that most offices, most law enforcement offices, have some sort of liaison that you can call or they will contact you and give you an update on what is happening in the, in the course of your investigation. Well, we have a crime, we have a criminal, we have a victim. Now we need law enforcement. We need somebody to investigate the crime. Actually, we need to know what a crime is first. Remember, state legislature is in charge of defining crime. These are the people who create the penal code. They are the ones that decide this action is a crime or this action is not a crime. It is state agencies and local law officials, state agencies, DPS, the, the troop, uh, also under the troopers, Texas Rangers, are the police, the sheriff, or the constables. These are the people that are responsible for enforcing the state laws. When we're talking about enforcement, this is the last table I found. It was from around 2011. And as a state, this is our clearance rate. What I mean is, th what I mean is these are the number of crimes that are solved. If you look at murder, 80% of all murders are cleared. 80% of all murders are, are solved. 44% of all rapes. Technically, the name is sexual assault, but it's rape. 25% of robberies are solved. 50% of aggravated assaults are solved. 10% of burglary are solved. 17% of larceny or theft crimes are solved. 13% of motor vehicle thefts are solved. 16% of arson are solved. Remember what I told you, that crime is down. Certain crimes go, their, their rates increase, but overall crime is down. But what I want you to get from this chart is, look at the top four. These have our highest clearance rates. Murder, 80%. Rape, 44%. Robbery, 25%. Aggravated assault, 50%. Two things. These are all crimes against people, and these are all felonies. These are all the serious crimes. This burglary, this larceny, motor vehicle theft, arson, these are usually crimes against property, and they are not given the level of importance, or they are not, they're considered important, but we are using our human resources, our human capital, capital to focus on crimes against the person. State agencies. We're going to start talking about law enforcement. First one's going to be the Department of Public Safety. Almost everybody in here has some, had some sort of dealing with the Department of Public Safety, even if it's not because of breaking the law. You know, they do perform traffic. They, they do per, uh, patrol our roads. But they also handle emergency management. Most of us know them because they conduct driver examinations. We have to go down to the Department of Public Safety and take our driving test to get our driver's license. DPS is also responsible for collecting crime statistics. The local PDs or the local sheriffs, the, the local agencies, will send their crime statistics to the Department of Public Safety. They will put all this data together in a table and they will go ahead and pass it on to the FBI. 
DPS operates regional crime labs. And they perform highway patrol in rural areas. This one. Most of us see DPS on the highways in the rural areas. This does not mean that they do not have jurisdiction, that they do not have authority to enforce laws in the city. The Department of Public Safety, these troopers, have the authority to enforce state law anywhere within the state of Texas. They are very, very powerful. So just because I'm telling you they perform patrol duty in, on the highway in rural areas, they can still pull you over and give you a citation in one of the downtown metro areas. They still have that authority. Another state agency is going to be the Texas Alcohol Beverage, Alcoholic Beverage Commission, TAB website. I, I provide a link to the TABC website. They're the ones that are going to go through and check the bars and the stores that sell alcoholic beverages. Make sure all state laws are being followed. That nothing is being sold to underage to, to minors. That is what they do. Our local agencies. First one is going to be the sheriff or the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff is the major enforcer of law in the county. The Sheriff is a county official elected in county-wide elections. They are elected for a four-year term. The major job of the Sheriff, and the Sheriff himself, not the Sheriff's Department, is to manage the county jail. There are certain laws that must be followed. We Certain health and safety laws. They're, they cannot be overcrowded, this type of thing. The sheriff is responsible for making sure that we say, stay within state and federal mandated numbers. They can execute court orders. What I mean by this is they can serve arrest warrants. They can serve search warrants. They also have the, their jurisdiction is in the county. This means that they can apprehend violators of state law in the county. Continue local agencies, we have constables. Constables are relatively minor county officials. They're elected and they serve a four-year term. Constables are broken up into precincts. They will serve the justice of the peace. If you re remember that discussion, we talked about justice of the peace. We had precincts. They could have up to one to eight precincts in a, in a county depending on the population. There is one constable per JP precinct. They are assigned to that precinct. That is the, the precinct they, where they work out of. There is one elected constable, the head of the constable's department, out of each precinct. Constables, while they do more of the white collar, they do more of the paperwork, they are still peace officers. They are going to pass the same the same state test that your constable or that your sheriff deputies are going to pass, that your police are going to pass, your police officers are going to pass, that your state agents have to pass. They all have to pass the same state test. The last is city police, and city police bear the greatest burden burden time and money wise. They, they bear the greatest burden caused by law enforcement. Why is this? Well simply think about it. A precinct is a small area so they're going to have a limited number of people. County is a big area but yet they still have authority over a wide wide area. They don't go into the cities much because the cities have their own, own police department so the cities are going to basically deal with the, the criminals in the city. The police department is going to basically deal with the criminals in the city while the county is going to attempt to handle the criminals outside of the city but still within the county, the county limits. 
So what we see is that for these local agencies, the cities and counties have the, have the highest burden in regards to money and law enforcement. City and counties spend as much as 30% of their entire budget simply for law enforcement. 